Today I want to start with the verse that we ended with last week in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 7 and make just a couple of comments and then dive into a little bit of a of a different topic today. I want to have probably a little bit more of a conversation today than than maybe um, a lecture or a teaching, but I want to give you some really practical tools that I think will help you in in your walk in this in this journey in which we're being changed into his image. So in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, Paul says, I'll read the whole verse even though we're just looking at the last phrase. Paul says, "Have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths." Rather, train yourself to godliness. It's interesting, the word train um, in that verse comes from the Greek word from which we get our word gymnasium. And so the idea being that just as an athlete physically trains himself or herself and has to put in sweat and exercise in effort in order to grow, Paul is challenging Timothy to have that same dedication. So obviously he's not talking about physical sweat here, but he's talking about spiritual sweat. And he's talking about um, us putting ourselves in a situation where God can use us. Uh, By the way, I'm going to talk about several books tonight. And so guys, if you've never read this book, I don't know how many of our guys are readers, but uh, the disciplines of a godly man. So First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7 is the premise of this book that Kent Hughes uses. I've probably taken 25 men through this book. Just an absolutely phenomenal book. And so it's talking about spiritual disciplines. And the whole first chapter is on First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7. And so uh, I would highly recommend that. So um, let me give just a brief synopsis, even though Pam probably did a better job than I'm going to do right now. But the last few weeks, we've studied God's divine plan for our sanctification. We've seen the process of our sanctification, and so it's called progressive sanctification. So we were, we were chosen in Him. We know what the end result is. But in the meantime, he's working in us. He's progressively, little by little, molding us into the person of Jesus Christ. We've seen that it's not something that we fabricate. It's not something that we produce. It's something that God does in us. He who began a good work in us will what? Will complete it, will finish it at the day of Jesus Christ. That does not mean, though, that there is no human element to our sanctification. So the idea is not that I'm going to sit over in the corner, I'm going to cross my, my, my arms, I guess cross my eyes too, I could cross my arms, and, and just trust for God to make me who he wants me to be. Or I guess, you know, the idea is not that I go to bed at night, and in the morning I wake up, and I'm a stronger believer. There is a human element in this. And so I want to explain exactly what that human element is tonight so we don't misunderstand it, and then we can apply it to our lives. So we already saw Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12 in the first week where Paul said, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, uh, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So there is Paul talking about the element that we have. Now we know, we already looked at verse 13 that says right after this, that says, but it is God who is at work in you. And so uh, God, God takes the tools, God takes our willingness, God takes our submission, and he is alive and well within us. So, so today I want to talk just a little bit about spiritual discipline. So is that, uh, Kat, do you have any sheets for David and Janet? Uh, here's David. I don't know whether Janet got one either. We want to make sure they get one. Thank you. So, so, so when I use the term spiritual disciplines, is that is that a familiar term to us, or is that an unfamiliar term to us? Unfamiliar? Uh, anybody else? Has anybody heard of that term, spiritual disciplines? You've heard of it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to kind of dive into it and 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 give an intro to it tonight i want to talk about what it's not so we don't misunderstand it 
and then talk about what it is and then uh, kind of give you some practical things as we go through it. So the first thing, and I really want to hit this, and so we might get a little deep and a little historical and maybe have a little fun right here, but the first point is this, is that spiritual discipline is not asceticism, all right? So if you want to know how to spell that, it's right underneath it, all right? So, 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 so I didn't mean to confuse you. I just like to give you some things to write, all right? Spiritual discipline is not asceticism. And so I want to talk about that because there is a, even though there's a fine line between the two, there is a marked difference between the two. So I've given you those notes, all right? Asceticism is the practice of self-denial in an attempt to draw closer to God. It may include such disciplines as fasting, celibacy, wearing simple or uncomfortable clothing, poverty, sleep deprivation, and in extreme forms, flagellation and self-mutilation, all right? Um, those might seem, you might sit back and think, boy, somebody have to be a fanatic to do that. Well, there are a lot of people around the world who do those extreme type of things hoping to draw them close to God. For example, you can even see every year in Easter, if you watch, they'll, they'll show it on TV in the Philippines. There, there are men and women that actually will get crucified. They will be crucified. So their idea is if they do that, if they are crucified just as Jesus, that it is going to help them to win God's approval and draw them closer to him. And so that practice of self-denial in whatever form it takes is called asceticism, all right? So then I've kind of made it a little bit simpler underneath that. So asceticism then is the belief that denying oneself of physical pleasures will help win God's approval and thus lead an individual to a higher level of spirituality. That's not my definition. That's a, an official definition of asceticism. So let me read it again, then I want to ask you a question, all right? So asceticism is the belief that denying oneself of physical pleasures will help win God's approval and thus lead an individual to a higher level of spirituality. So as you read those three lines, there should be something that steps out to you and you sit back and say, wait a second, that just doesn't sound right. So as you read that, what doesn't sound right in that phrase? Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, self-inflicted, self-inflicted pain, okay? Somebody else, as you read that, is there something that sits out? You should say, but boy, as we've gone through our study, there's something that just doesn't sound right there. Anybody? Right, yeah, 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 yeah. obviously there's parts of that. You haven't taken that class at HCC yet where you're supposed to <laughs> denounce all of your funds and sign your bank account over to us? You haven't taken that class yet. Huh? No, you're right. So, so, so the one part that I, I wanted to emphasize and I wanted you to catch is, the, is what's underlined, all right, where it says that, that they have this belief that by doing certain things, they win God's approval. All right, so uh, let me remind you that everything that we do, justification and sanctification, is what? It's a work of grace. And there's absolutely nothing that we can do to win God's approval. All right, so, uh, so, so I mean, so, so Isaiah says it this way. Remember, all of our righteousness, all of our righteous deeds is just like what? Just like filthy rags in God's eyes. And so, even though, so tonight we are going to talk about spiritual disciplines, but there is a difference behind the purpose of doing spiritual disciplines and what they're talking about here, because these individuals do this sitting back thinking that God is going to be pleased with what they're doing, and they are going to win God's approval. And that's the sedatism. And so what I'm saying is this, that spiritual disciplines 
are not asceticism. They're two different things. All right. Now, ascetics, and I keep using that word, that's a tough word to say, mention somebody in the New Testament as their first example. And they sit back and say, well, this person was an ascetic, and they did it, and we're following him. And I know I'm just throwing out questions tonight, so I don't mean to put you on the spot. Can anybody think of, of who they would lift up in the New Testament as an example? No, not, not Paul. John the Baptist. John the Baptist, all right? Because John the Baptist, remember, he, uh, he lived out in the desert. He wore, he wore rough clothing, <laughs> He wore rough clothing. He ate locusts and wild honey. And so ascetics looked to John the Baptist as their forefather. And many of the ascetics were known, when you study church history, they were known as what was called the Desert Fathers. And the reason they were known for that is that they literally went out and lived in the desert. And their thinking was that they were going to make their lifestyle as difficult as they possibly could, thinking that making their life difficult would win God's approval. Let me just give you two examples. And so if you're interested in that, you can Google the Desert Fathers or Ascetics, and you can find all type of examples. Let me give you two of them. The very first one and the most famous was a gentleman by the name of Anthony the Great. Anthony the Great. So one day, Anthony uh, was teaching on Jesus saying that, uh, the, that's found in Matthew 19, that says, if you want to be perfect, go and sell what you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. And so as he was teaching that, in his mind, a light came on, and he literally finished that message, went out and sold everything that he had, gave his proceeds to the poor, left the city behind, and lived in the desert for the rest of his life. All right? Anthony the Great. And by the way, so, so, so this ascetic lifestyle has a little bit to do with the monastic lifestyle. You've heard about monasteries. Where, where, you know, these spiritual people would separate themselves and they would have a very simplistic lifestyle. The thought process is this whole ascetic uh, thought process that by doing this, we are going to please God. So Anthony the Great was the first one. There was another one. This guy, I read about this guy this week. This guy was funny. His name was Simeon Stylitz. So Simeon Stylitz spent the last 36 years of his life atop a 50-foot pole in the air. And so he, his thought process was that, that if he wanted to be spiritual, he was going to have to separate himself completely from everyone else. And so he literally constructed a 50-foot pole in the air trying to separate himself from all of the comforts of life and trying to separate himself from people as well. Aren't you glad that God doesn't ask us to do that? Aren't you glad that we don't have like in our new members class, okay, here's the goal. We're gonna, we, have a, we have these 50-foot poles outside, and here's what we want you to do. We want you to expose yourself to the elements, and we want you to live as badly as you possibly can. All right, so you can Google all that and study all of that. But here's the truth, and here's what I want you to catch. And I want us to look at a couple of verses because the Apostle Paul actually deals with this concept in his epistles. But the truth is this. Human effort cannot produce spiritual change. All right? Catch that. Human effort cannot produce spiritual change. That's what we've been talking about, right? It has to be a work of the Holy Spirit of God. So it's not turning over a new leaf. It's not determining I'm going to do something different. Human effort cannot produce spiritual change. doesn't mean somebody can't change for the better a little bit. I mean, there's, there's unsaved people that, that better their lives and do all of that, but that's not spiritual change. Only the Holy Spirit of God can produce spiritual change. And Paul addresses that. Go with me to Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. This is a really interesting. I spent quite a bit of time in these three verses, or four verses, I guess, the last couple of days. Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. And a little bit uh, ambiguous. Of course, Colossians is not the easiest book to address. Paul is dealing with Gnosticism and the false wisdom that was going on in his day and all of that. But notice what Paul says. Colossians chapter 2, and begin in verse 20. So Paul says this. If with Christ you died to the element 
uh, to the elemental spirits or principles of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? He puts a hyphen saying, let me give you a couple of examples. Don't handle or don't touch or don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. All right. Now, we sit back, and especially somebody who comes from a legalistic mindset, I sit back and th- think, that's pretty much the way I was raised, all right? I was, uh, I was basically given the things that I was told I was supposed to do and a list of things that I was told I wasn't supposed to do. And so Paul is sitting back saying, now, wait a second, if we've died to the elemental principles of the world, why do we still act as if we're alive to the world And these things are going to affect us. And we submit ourselves to man-made rules such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. Referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom. So, 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 So these rules whatever they are, have an appearance of wisdom. They have an appearance of spirituality. It makes sense to us humanly saying, boy, we just need to tell people what they can do and what they can't do, and we're going to make it easy. It has an appearance of wisdom in promoting, I don't know what version you have, but I love how the ESV says it, in promoting self-made religion, and notice the next word, and what? An asceticism and severity to the body. All right, so here's what Paul is saying. And Paul was living in a day and age. So, so, so Paul was dealing with Gnosticism and Paul was dealing with asceticism. And both of them were concepts, even though they were kind of parallel concepts. They were concepts that uh, Gnosticism basically said that the physical world is evil and only spiritual things mattered. And they took it to an extreme saying, hey, you know what? Gnostics said, you know what? You can do whatever you want with your bodies because your body is physical and it's only your soul that really matters. Ascetics were on that parallel thing saying, yeah, the physical world is evil. And as a result of that, we need to set up all kinds of rules to keep people from falling into those temptations. And here's what Paul says. Paul says, those are self-made religions. Self-made religions, not my word, his word. Self-made religions that lead to asceticism and lead to severity to the body. Now, even if we stopped it there, we get it. But notice the next phrase, because Paul clarifies everything that he was saying in the next phrase. He says this, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. So, so, So catch what Paul is saying. It's not rules that make us change. We can set all the rules that we want, but rules do not accomplish spiritual change. I can give all kinds of examples, and you guys could too. So I told you before that I grew up in a legalistic church, an incredibly legalistic church. So if I told you the list of things that we weren't allowed to do, I mean, we weren't allowed to do everything from, you know, playing cards, never owned a a deck of playing cards in our entire life, uh, never did any of that, never went to a movie theater until I was married and 25 years old, never did, all, all of that was taboo, so we had these lists of things, weren't allowed to listen to rock music, we actually were, 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 Kind of like a mantra. We were supposed to repeat back, rock music is bad. Rock music is bad. And we had this. So, 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 so everybody that grew up in my generation, we were given these rules that we were told that we had to obey. And, and many of the kids that grew up in my youth group, even though they knew the rules, guess what they did? Every opportunity they had, they snuck out to do what? What, what they were told not to do. So, so they were really good at learning to abide by the rules when they were in front of everybody. But it didn't produce any spiritual change at all. To a certain degree, that's asceticism. It's sitting back saying, okay, here's what we're going to do. So we're going we're gonna to make you do certain things because we want to create this outer appearance of holiness. And just because someone appears holy on the outside doesn't mean they're holy on the inside. Does that make sense? 
Does that make sense? And so the, that's the reason I wanted to bring that out because when we talk about spiritual disciplines, we are not talking about creating these things that you have to do every day from a legalistic point of view, and if you don't do it, you're not spiritual. That, that takes us right back to where we came from. That's not what we're talking about. I'm sorry? Exactly. What, 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 and, and let me just go through. So let me read a couple of things that I put in my notes. So Paul lists some of the outward forms that people use to control sin. Touch not, taste not, handle not. And although these man-made rules seem practical and helpful in promoting spirituality, they're really nothing more than adopting a system of religion based on what he calls elementary spirits or elementary principles of the world. Paul says that such self-imposed rules are really just a form of legalism which leads to self-made religion. So so look at this again, and I know I'm spending a little bit of time here, but I think it's really, really important for us to understand. So he says in verse 23, if you have your Bible in front of you, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion. Anybody have a King James? Anybody have a King James? Could somebody read verse 23 from a King James Bible, if you have it. What does it say? What is it? Yeah, verse 23. Mm-hmm. No, that's not it. That's not it. Colossians 2.23. Okay, stop right there. Which things have a show of wisdom in, here's what it uses, will worship. All right, that's the word. I love that phrase when you think about it, all right? So here's what I say. The King James translates it will worship, and here's what he's saying. The moment we feel we can succeed and attain victory over sin by our strength and our will alone, guess what we're worshiping? We're not worshiping God. We're worshiping our will. We're worshiping our ability to change. I said, isn't it ironic that Paul looks at our most strenuous efforts in the spiritual walk, and here's what he calls them, idolatry. So Paul says, if you're sitting back and you are depending upon this list of rules, now listen, I'm not saying that all of a sudden we go berserk. This isn't libertarianism where we sit back and say, okay, okay, everything is up for grabs. That's not what Paul is saying. But Paul is saying if we sit back and think that we're going to create this, the, these rules and these rules are going to make us spiritual, it's not going to happen. Now, now, now this is really, really, really important for parents. Because as parents, we sit back and we're not careful. The easy things to do is to set a a list of rules for our kids. And the best thing that we can do for our kids is make sure they have an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ and not know a set of rules that they're supposed to follow. All right, I'm telling you where I came from. I love my mom and dad to death, and they would agree with me today that we were given a set of rules, and that's what spirituality was rather than sat back and told, listen, here's what we, we want you to learn to love Jesus. And if you learn to love Jesus, all of that becomes natural. So Paul says this in verse 23, he says, they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Let me give you a couple of applications and then we'll move on, all right? So here's what I wrote, really simple. You guys know I got a simple mind. Rules will never make you more holy. Rules will never make you more holy. Henry Arnold, who has written a lot about this idea of spiritual disciplines and holiness, makes this statement. He says, as long as we think we can save ourselves by our own willpower, we will only make evil stronger in us. Think about that. So so when we sit back and think, I can do this. (laughs) I don't need the power of the Holy Spirit of God. I can do this. We really only make evil stronger in ourselves. And we actually succumb to the things that we want to overcome. So I say this, the needed change within us is God's work and not ours. The needed change within us is God's work and not ours. The demand is for an inside job. 
And only God can work from the inside. Remember, remember what Jesus called the scribes and the Pharisees? Does anybody remember what he called them? I mean, he, he called them some pretty scandalous things. He called them hypocrites. Anybody else know what he, anybody, uh, there's the term that I'm thinking of. Whitewashed sepulchers. That's exactly what he called them. So, so, so what is he saying in that? He said you would look what? You look really good on the outside. But on the inside, you're what? You're dead on the inside. So, so you're beautifully painted sepulchers is what you are. So, so if, I can be, if I can be critical of the church, not just Hollywood Community Church, but I can be critical of the Big C Church, if we're not careful, we're guilty of creating whitewashed sepulchers. That, that we preach and teach more about certain rules and living up to this lifestyle rather than this idea of knowing Jesus Submitting to the Holy Spirit of God and allowing the Holy Spirit of God to work in our life. And so one of the reasons we do that, and I can speak from a parent because I'm, I've been guilty of it too. One of the things we do, one of the reasons we do that, and, and I know it sounds like I'm being critical, quite frankly, is that we don't trust the Holy Spirit of God to do the job. And we think that we've got to do this, that, and the other in order for our kids to change. Listen, I'm not saying, I am not saying don't put rules for your kids. That's the last thing I'm saying. But what I am saying is, no matter what rules you put, that's not going to produce change in the lives of your kids. Only God can do that. So the first point is this. Spiritual discipline is not asceticism. Asceticism will lead to self-made religion. It will lead to legalism. So let's talk about what it is. So spiritual disciplines do, though, demonstrate a heart for God. Spiritual disciplines demonstrate a heart for God. Somebody read for me Psalm 42, 1 and 2. Psalm 42, 1 and 2. I love this verse. Love it, love it, love it. Psalm 42, 1 and 2. Anybody found it? First person who finds it can read it. All right, this is a sword drill. Come on. First, Psalm 42, 1 and 2. Okay. As the deep deer pants for a stream of water, so my soul pants for you, Father. My soul thirsts for a God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? Okay, so see, here's what's it. As the deer pants for water, so my soul pants for you oh god so 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 listen that's what i i want to use that as a basis so when we start talking about spiritual disciplines in a moment we're not talking about things that you need to do and it needs to be a checklist that you go through we're talking about this this passion this desire for god this desire for holiness that is going to drive you to spend time with him. So I wrote, the primary requirement to practice the spiritual disciplines is a longing after God. The primary requirement to practice spiritual disciplines is a longing after God, the desire to know him, understand him, and follow him. One of the verses that's always amazed me is um, what Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. So here's Paul. So we know Paul... Uh, Philippians was one of Paul's prison epistles. So, so he's, he's already founded most of the churches. He's already written a good portion of the New Testament. If anybody would have had an intimate relationship with Jesus, we'd sit back and said, boy, it's Paul. And Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, he says what? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I sit back and I, and I read that and, and I can sense this longing in Paul's life, this desire to know God as intimately and as, as, as comprehensively and as purposefully and personally as he possibly can. If I could describe spiritual disciplines, that's what it is. It's this desire, this thirst for God that drives us to put these disciplines in practice in our life for the purpose of knowing Him more. Does that make sense? And so spiritual disciplines demonstrate a heart for God. The the, the third thing, and I'm kind of bouncing through some of this, but the third thing is spiritual disciplines prepare the heart 
for God to work. Spiritual disciplines prepare the heart for God to work. So, so let me read Galatians chapter 6 and verse 8. Galatians 6, 8. Paul says this. He said, For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Okay, I know, probably not a single farmer here. Do we at least have a gardener here? <laughs> Anybody a gardener? So, 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 you like to pretend, all right? So, so you at least don't kill plants, right? All right, so before, in, in theory, before you plant a plant, I guess that's the, way, the best way you'd say it. In theory, before you plant a plant, what do you do? You prepare the soil. That, 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 that's exactly right. And so you, you don't grow the plant. The soil grows the plant. Actually, nature and God grows the, grows the plants, all right? But, but you prepare the soil. So, so, so here's what I want you to think. I want you to think of spiritual disciplines as soil preparation. Preparing the soil of our soul for God to work and to grow something in our lives. Here's, a, here's another great book. I would highly recommend this. I've probably read this five times. It's by Richard Foster. It's a classic on spiritual disciplines called The Celebration of Discipline. I would highly, highly, highly recommend this book. But anyways, he makes this statement talking about Romans chapter 6, the verses that I just read. He says, Paul's analogy of the soil there is instructive. And he says this, A farmer is helpless to grow grain. All the farmer can do is provide the right conditions for the growing of grain. He cultivates the ground. He plants the seeds. He waters the plants. And then the natural forces of the earth take over and up comes the grain. That's the way it is with spiritual disciplines. They are a way of sowing to the Spirit. That's what Paul says. If we sow to the flesh, we'll reap the flesh. But if we sow to the Spirit, we will reap eternal life. So the question really is, what are we doing to prepare our souls for God to work in our life? Now, we can sit back and say, wait a second, it, it, God's the one to do it. He, he told me he was going to do it, so, 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 so I'm expecting him to do it. And I get all of that, but, but our job is not to do the change. This is the paradigm shift for us. Our job is not to change. My only job is to prepare my heart, to prepare the soil for God to do a work in me. So he says this, this is the way the spiritual disciplines are. They're a way of sowing to the Spirit. The disciplines are God's way of getting us into the ground. The disciplines are, or excuse me, they put us where He can work within us and transform us. So, so quite, quite frankly, using that whole analogy, if we're not careful, we can limit or at least slow down what God desires to accomplish in our life by not making ourselves pliable or our soil to be useful for him to work in our lives. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? And so there's, a, there's so many ways that I, can, that I can apply this, but, you know, the most simple way is... And, and as a pastor, sometimes without being critical, sometimes as a pastor you see that because cause I, cause I get the sense lots of times that our congregation comes in on Sunday and their attitude is, feed me! I'm, I'm starved! Feed me! Pastor Brian, I want to be fed! And, and one of the most discouraging things is that you know, you know, people come in and say, I just don't feel like you're feeding me enough. I'm, I'm, we've had church members, any pastor who's been around for a while has heard that, and I want to look at him and say, listen, my job is to only feed you one little meal a day. That, that, that's it. 
One little meal a week, that's it. If you're not feeding yourself, if you're not preparing yourself the rest of the week, guess what? You're not going to grow. And one of the, one of the criticisms that I have of American Christianity, and actually Christianity around the world, is that as believers, we have, we have shucked to a little bit this idea of spiritual disciplines. We're so busy during the week. We have so many things that distract us. We're doing so many things that during the week we are not cultivating the soil and we come to church starved on Sunday morning and we wonder why one little meal is not enough for us and we're not growing to the level that God desires for us to grow. And so the idea of spiritual disciplines is just this. God, I want to I till the soil. I want to fertilize the soil. I want to make my heart pliable and soft and tender and submissive to you so that when you speak, I hear. I'm used to hearing your voice. I, I mean, remember the story of Samuel, the first time God spoke to him? Samuel had no idea who was speaking to him. And, 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 uh, and, uh, and it was Eli that had the term, listen, that's God who's speaking to you. Train your ear to hear the voice of God. And I'm afraid that at times we're so distracted by so much other noise that we haven't trained our ears to hear the voice of God. And as we talked about in our Pray Believing series in the beginning of the year, it's not that God's not speaking. God's not speaking, or God is speaking, I'm sorry, He is speaking, but there's so much noise around us that we just can't hear Him. And so spiritual disciplines, the idea of that is that I'm going to put myself in a place where I can hear God. So having said all of that, i got like 10 minutes left or something like that. Let me, let me talk about several spiritual disciplines, all right? I'm going to talk about three, all right? Um, Foster, I think, talks about Seven, I think he talks about it here. Um, uh, Kent Hughes, I think, talks about 20 different spiritual disciplines. So I'm going to talk about three, and I'm going to talk about three of what I would consider the main ones, but, but they're important. All right, so the first one is this. Meditate on and memorize the Scriptures. Meditate on and memorize the Scriptures. So somebody tell me what verb I didn't use right there. Real simple word, because lots of times when we talk about the scriptures, what verb do we use? Read. That's exactly right. So, so we sit back and say, read the scriptures. And if we're not careful, it's easy for us to grab our Bible, read through a chapter, and it make no change in our life. And so the challenge, the discipline is not just reading the scriptures, but the challenge is meditating on the scriptures and memorizing the Scriptures. Let me, let me read a couple of verses, and you have them there. And For time's sake, we won't take the time to look at them. Psalm chapter 1 and verse 2, as David talks about the blessed man, it says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. David said in Psalm 63, 6 through 8, When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you, in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. Speaking of memorization, David said in Psalm 119.9, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it with your word. And then Paul said in Romans 12, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. So when we use this term meditation, there, there are two Hebrew words that are translated meditation in the Old Testament. We won't get into the word because I can't pronounce them and it wouldn't make any difference to you anyways. But those, but those two words are used 58 times in the Old Testament. Here's what they mean. They mean listening to God's word. Reflecting on God's works. Rehearsing God's deeds ruminating on God's law. Ruminate isn't a verb that we use very very often, but it's the word from which farmers get the word chew the cud, to ruminate, to chew on something over and over and over and over again. So let me just, so let's synthesize that just a little bit. Christian meditation then is the ability to hear God's voice, 
and obey his word. That sounds a little simplistic and legalistic. What I mean by that, hear God's voice, understand what he's saying, and put it in practice in our lives. So we're actually going to do an exercise here in just a second, okay? All right? Um, Unfortunately, though, when we think of meditation, that word has been stolen from us, all right? When we think of meditation, what do we think of? Eastern meditation, right? We think of Eastern meditation because they've kind of stolen that. But, but, but they're two completely different things. And I want you to catch this. Eastern meditation is an attempt to empty the mind. And so, so that's that whole thing about Eastern meditation and yoga and everything. So they tell you just sit there and what? Empty your mind. Take everything out of your mind. When the Bible talks about meditation, that's not what it's talking about. He's not talking about emptying your mind. He's talking about what? Filling your mind. It's the opposite of what we think of meditation. Meditation is not emptying my mind of all of these things. It's saying, I want to fill my mind with God's Word and think on it and dwell on it. The The meditation of Scripture focuses on two things. It focuses on internalizing and personalizing the passage of Scripture. I think sometimes if we're not careful, and I think as pastors we're good about this, or we're, we're, we're bad at this, we do this all the time, we're good at making you do this, is, is I think we try to get too deep. And we use, you know, we talk about, you know, the exegesis of the passage, and we talk about all of that. But, 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 but the idea of reading Scripture is just sitting back and simply saying, what is it that the Holy Spirit of God is saying to me? One of my heroes, Christian heroes, is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, he said, just as you do not analyze the words of someone you love, but you accept them as they are said to you, accept the word of Scripture and ponder it in your heart. That's what meditation is. So, so, so let's just take an example for a second. Can we do that? Yes, uh, yeah. Internalizing and personalizing the passage of Scripture. Internalizing and personalizing the passage of Scripture. So, so, so in, 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 let me just say this when we talk about that. We have to have the conviction, first of all, that the Word of God is alive. Hebrews 4.12. The Word of God is alive. It's quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. So we're reading something. This isn't, just isn't any book. This is a book that's alive. All right, these are, these are Jesus' living words for us. But we also have to believe that the Bible is not just for God's people in general, but it's for me. It's for you. And so God desires to personally speak to us through his word. Sometimes I think if we're not careful, we look at this as a spiritual textbook that is going to teach us what we're supposed to believe, but we don't look at it as God speaking to me, God speaking to you. And I want all of us to sit back and realize that when we open up God's Word, it is God literally carrying on a conversation with us. And what I am reading, what you are reading, is what God wants you to read, and he wants to accomplish something through that, not just in the Big C Church, but he wants to accomplish something in your life and mine. And so we have to approach Scripture that way, have to approach Scripture with the idea, with the question, God, what is it that you are saying to me? So, so, so can we take five minutes and do an exercise? I kind of want to give you an exercise, so let's do an exercise. So, so, so look up one verse with me. Look up John 14, 27, all right? And so we're going we're gonna to pretend that your devotions today are in John chapter 14, and you're reading John chapter 14, and we're going to look at one verse. John 14, 27. So this is that great, you know, chapter of Jesus. You know, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. I'm leaving. But if I don't leave, the Holy Spirit won't come, that whole thing. And so this great promise. And so he comes down to verse 27, and he makes this, the, this great promise. He says this, Peace I leave with you. My peace 
I give you. Don't let your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So, so sit back for a second and think about that verse. Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. So think about that. So what are, what are some truths that, that you and I can glean from that one phrase? Somebody tell me, what are, what are some truths that we can glean from that phrase? Ray? Nope. Exactly, yeah. So, so that's exactly what he's saying. So, so, he's, so, 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 so we live, we live, and, and now we're getting into a little bit of psychology, but we live in a day in which most people don't experience peace. I mean, we live with anxiety. We live with worry. We live with fear. We live with uncertainty. And, and here's what Jesus says. My peace I give to you. So, so how profound is his peace? Can you imagine, he, 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 even on the cross when he was going through in agony, he knew who he was. He was the very son of God. He was able to experience peace going through suffering. And he looks at us and says, this peace that I have, I give to you. So, so, so go, Joe, go, 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 go. What's that? I'm sorry. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I mean, why is, why is alcoholism a problem? Why is divorce and remarriage a problem? Why is whatever a problem? Because people are searching for peace in, in every crevice and corner. And Jesus is saying, I want to give it to you. My peace I give to you. So, so, so every single day, I can take that. And, and, and obviously the word peace there is the Hebrew word shalom, which means it's, no, it's not just freedom from fear. It, 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 it's, this, it's this totally encompassing word right there. It, it, exactly. And so I can every morning sit back by faith and say, man, God, today's a pretty rough day. I claim your peace. And I'm not, I'm not egotistically claiming something that's not mine. I'm not asking for something that you haven't promised to give me. You told me, my peace I give to you. He goes for, further and he says, he, he hits your point. He says, not as the world gives, though I don't give it to you. I give you a peace that's completely different. So, so my point is this. Sometimes I think we get wrapped up in the forest and we fail to see the trees or the leaves, because because we're not careful. We've we're we're so uh, we're so goal driven that I've got to finish this chapter. I've got to get through this book. I got to read the Bible in a year. I got to do all of these things, and we're so content. We're so focused on the forest that we never sit back and allow one truth, one nugget, to change our lives. And to sit back and think about it and meditate on it and talk about what it means for me. Here, here's the truth that I believe with all of my heart. So, and this is profound. Think about this. If God's word is alive, and it is, all right? It tells us that. Hebrews, I just quoted the verse, Hebrews chapter 12. It's alive. It's alive. So one phrase, one nugget has enough truth to feed me for my entire life. So imagine, as it were, that we lose freedoms in our country, we're sent to prison for our faith, our Bibles are confiscated, and the only part of Scripture that we know is what we have in our mind, which is a whole different point for memorization that I want to talk about in just a second. But I believe with all of my heart that there is enough spiritual meat in one phrase to sustain me for weeks and months on end. Our problem is we read it, we don't meditate on it. 
And so David said in Psalm chapter 1, no, the blessed man is the one who meditates on God's word. And he or she is going to be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water that's going to do what? It's going to bring forth fruit in his season. Why? Because you're spending time memorizing, or excuse me, meditating and memorizing on God's word. So just about that about that verse, contemplate the fact that he is filling you with his peace. He's promised. His peace is different than the world offers you. And so I can sit back and say, God, what are my fears today? I want to roll those fears over on you and I want to accept your peace and accept by faith the peace that he has offered you. That's one simple verse. Meditate. And then memorize. Memorization allows you to have God's word in your heart 24-7. I wish I was good. Anybody here practice memorization now? Anybody try? Do you? Do, do you? God bless you. I'm, uh, I, I don't think my brain works that way anymore. I, I, I cannot memorize now like I could when I was a kid. Do you find is it easier or hard, a lot harder for you, Ray? Or? Oh, just over and over and over and over again. I'm telling you what, though. Have your kids memorize Scripture when they're young. My mom was, uh, in all of her legalism, well, well, and, and my mom and dad will be here. I don't want you to think badly of them. They're godly, <laughs> godly, godly people. They were just in a system, uh, a system that we were all raised up in. But my mom, my, my mom had me memorize scripture when I was a kid. And it, I know that scripture. James chapter 1, I can quote James, the whole James chapter 1, James, the servant of God and Lord Jesus Christ, the 12 tribes who were scattered abroad, greeting. My brother, encounter all joy when you fall into different temptations, knowing the trying of your faith. Listen, I, I'm so thankful, because you know where that is? That's right here now. And the more you memorize Scripture, the more it's available for you 24-7. Listen, what's a discipline? Meditation, memorization. What are you doing? You're preparing your soul for God to work in you. Let me give you two more. I'm just going to mention this one. The second one is prayer. Of all the spiritual disciplines, prayer is the most essential, I believe, because it ushers us into the very presence of God. Um, just a couple. Oh, man, my time's up. Um, man, I'm sorry. So, so let me just get through this. Uh, you have the rest, because I didn't think I was going to get through the last one. But, but remember that real prayer is something that we learn. All right? Remember the disciples said what? Teach us to pray. Think about that. that. That's poignant because here were guys who were raised in Judaism. The, the, here are guys that for the most part were taught to pray from a young age. And they looked at Jesus and said, teach us to pray. I thought about that. Why do you think that is? Here's what I thought. They, they were taught to pray one way. And all of a sudden, they experienced Jesus praying. And they realized that Jesus' communication with his Father was so much different than theirs. And they said, Lord, teach us to pray. So don't be discouraged with your prayer life. Prayer life is what? It's an ongoing lesson. To, so, so the idea that, that we need to be taught to pray means what? That we never master it that we're always learning, we're going to do that. We talked a lot about prayer last week, and so I'm not going to spend any time doing that. The, the, the other thing I put there is prayer is not just talking, it is also listening. We talked about that. Be still and know that I am God. The last one I'm going to give it to you is the, is the discipline of fasting. So, so this is something that, I'm going to be really honest, is difficult for me. Oh, my word, is it difficult for me. I wish I could look at you and say, hey, this is something that's, that's really easy for me, and it's not. I've always struggled with it for years because, because it's funny, and I put in your notes right there that there's, not, there's no scriptural mandate to fast. And so, uh, I mean, we are commanded to pray. We are commanded to do other things. We're never commanded in scripture to fast. But Jesus fasted. And uh, I think it's a discipline that, that in our minds, at the very least in our minds, it reminds us of what is most important. So listen, we did a lot of prep work here and didn't do a lot about disciplines, but there's all kinds of disciplines. There's the discipline of simplicity. There, the, there's the discipline of, uh, of, of giving. There's the different discipline of serving. All of those things where these are disciplines that we sit back and say, okay, God, I'm going to do these things not to please you, 
but I'm going to do these things to prepare my heart and my soul to be who God wants me 